Christian Parenting. Should we bring our kids to the big worship service? Or is it better for them to be in their own classes while we worship with the other adults? Let's talk about that today on Family Vision. Hi, my name is Lissy Reno. Welcome to Family Vision, the podcast from Visionary Family Ministries, strengthening families through practical, encouraging, and real conversations. Well, hello, Rob Reno here with Visionary Family Ministries. Thank you so much for taking this time to join me for these important conversations about our faith and our family relationships. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the last five episodes with my dear wife, Amy, as she's been exploring uh, these big questions about education and discipleship. I hope you're blessed. I hope you're encouraged. I hope that they were thought-provoking for you. Uh, I'm in the recording studio today, just 10 days ahead of our daughter Lissy's wedding. It is coming up soon. Can't wait for the big wedding day. I tell you, uh, my oldest son is married, and then this is my first daughter getting married. And for the father, there is a huge difference between the wedding of the son and the wedding of the daughter. Yes, financially, there's a huge difference. But like emotionally, okay, with my son, I was like, he's ready. God bless you. Go get him, kid. And with my daughter, walking her down the aisle, getting ready to give her away, as much as I love my future son-in-law, this is a a big deal. So can't wait after the wedding. Amy and I will be in and and we'll get to share uh, the stories of that special day coming up. Well, in this episode, we're going to continue a conversation that I started last week uh, talking about kids in church. Last week, I laid the foundation biblically, this pattern that we see in Scripture throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament. We see when God's people gathered for worship, they did it with all the generations. They had their children. They had their grandchildren. So today, I want to talk practically with you. How do we help our kids get the most out of church. Now, notice we're not going to talk about how to help get the most kids out of church. Some people have that mindset. How do we get the kids out of here? We're going to talk about how do we help our kids get the most out of church. So some practical ideas for you. Number one, start with your family worship time. Your family worship time, your family prayer, your family Bible time is the key preparation It's the key training ground to help your child's spirit practice up for worship with their big family. So when you pray at home, it helps them learn and prepare to pray at church. If you sing at home, it helps them learn to prepare and sing at church. When you read the scriptures and talk about it, it helps them to attend uh, their heart and their spirit to the reading of the Word of God. Now, one of the things that our church does to help us is uh, Wednesday or Thursday each week, they send us an email to let us know what the scripture is for the coming Sunday that the pastor will be preaching on. And they also send us one of the songs that we're going to be singing. Now, they do that so that families can read the scripture ahead of time. And we can talk about it ahead of time with our kids so that when the pastor says, okay, let's all open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 8 today, and they begin to to read, uh, our little ones, my Rush, my uh, seven-year-old, will say, oh, I know this one. We just read this as a family. And in the same way, if we have one of the songs that we're going to sing from the coming Sunday and we're able to sing that at home, it, it helps prime the pump and helps kids get prepared to engage. Now, if your church doesn't provide that for you, just email one of your pastors and say, hey, we'd like to, as a family, prepare our hearts for worship each Sunday. How could we find out the primary text that'll be a part of the sermon? And could you send us one of the songs uh, so that we can get prepared? And number two, um, one of the keys to helping your kids get the most out of church is to start on Saturday night. Uh, if your family's anything like ours, Sunday morning can be just uh, chaotic and stressful logistically. Even things of helping kids find clothes, helping kids find shoes. So one of the ways to make Sunday morning less stressful is before we go to bed, uh, get those clothes laid out, figure out what we're going to have for breakfast so that there's less stress and pressure on us Sunday morning. Uh, Number three, just start with your own heart. You know, ask God to give you an eagerness for worship with your church family because our children are going to see the overflow of our hearts. You know, and I have to ask myself this question. Do my children 
see me more excited about the game coming up on Sunday afternoon than they do seeing me excited about the chance to worship God on Sunday morning. And the reality is, is sometimes our hearts do get out of whack and they do get out of balance. So just the the action step here is pray. Ask God to give you an eagerness for worship with your church family. Uh, Number four, pray on the way to church. One of the uh, ways that we sometimes pray before church is a prayer like this. God, would you use each one of us as a blessing to someone at church this morning? And would you use someone else as a blessing for each one of us at church this morning so that we're seeing our gathering with our church family, the fellowship time that would come before and after the services as both a time of output, it's a time that we can be a blessing to other people, but it's also a time for input that God's brought us together with our brothers and sisters in Christ so that we would receive some encouragement. All right, number five, uh, on Sunday morning, and this is continuing on this helping your kids connect in fellowship theme and idea, is encourage your children to connect in conversations with you. So when you walk into church, there's five, 10 minutes, maybe before the service or certainly after uh, the service. And a lot of times what happens is parents and kids just scatter. Kids go see their friends, parents see their friends, and that's fine. But a lot of times you're standing there together and parents are having adult conversations while our kids are just sort of standing next to us. So use that opportunity to encourage your children to say hello to Mr. and Mrs. Smith while you're talking to Mr. and Mrs. Smith. If Mr. and Mrs. Smith have kids with them, don't just talk to the parents. Turn your attention to their children, to their grandchildren. You know, people talk about the importance of multi-generational connections, and our churches are a place where uh, our kids can build uh, these, these generational friendships. Well, that just doesn't happen automatically. It's gonna, you're going to have to fan the flame with that. You're going to have to be intentional to help your children talk to the other parents and grandparents and for you to be intentional, not just talking to other adults, but to the kids as well. Uh, number six, encourage your kids to bring their Bibles to church. Now, I prefer, it's just my preference, paper Bibles for the church service. I'm not opposed to phone Bibles, but I like paper Bibles. Uh, keeps me more uh, focused. And if you encourage your kids to bring paper Bibles with them when there is a scripture reading or when the sermon is announced, you know, help them find the spot in their Bible where they can read along. If they're real little and they don't have their own Bibles yet or they can't even read yet, still, you've got them on your lap or next to you. And still, put your Bible where they can see it. Open your Bible to the portion that's being read. Put your finger on the words that are being read and, and move it along so that they are getting these, these training wheels with how to engage in God's word personally during the worship service. Then number seven, uh, show them how to worship God. Show them how to worship God with your own singing with your own praying, with your own eager attention to the sermon. Now, with singing, you know, maybe you're like me. Maybe you're just not a very musical person. I do not have a great singing voice. I can make a joyful noise to the Lord, um, and I think God likes it. People around me don't, but God does. So I don't care. I'm not singing for the people. I'm singing uh, for him. So uh, this modeling for our kids in church So, so critical. If I were to tell you that your kids are going to engage with God someday the way you engage with God as a part of the church service, would would that be encouraging to you or would that be discouraging to you? Now, we're never going to set this perfect example uh, for our kids. The message here is not thou shalt be a perfect Christian so you can raise perfect Christian children. But, But this idea of modeling of do our kids see us engaging with our hearts, with our singing, with our praying, with our eager attention on the sermon. So, so critical. And then number eight, just have realistic expectations. Realistic expectations. Okay, yes, train and encourage kids to sit up. Train and encourage kids to pay attention. But if you have a two-year-old, they're probably going to act like a two-year-old. So wrap the time in, in a lot of love. I remember a situation years ago with our oldest son, R.W., he was two. I was preaching at a rural African-American church in Alabama. 
And uh, during my sermon, my two-year-old, our W, was, was walking up and down the aisles, running back and forth in the back of the church. And I'm trying to preach. Obviously, I was distracted. Obviously, I was a little bit embarrassed, but of course, he's two. But what really struck me was there was a whole ton of two-year-olds from this church scattered around the sanctuary, sitting there with their moms and dads, uh, with their eyes up, looking at me while I was preaching. So it was like, all right, two-year-olds are actually capable of sitting uh, calmly uh, and engaging in a two-year-old way, uh, maybe much earlier than, than we think. But again, flexibility with those kids, lots of love with those kids. I remember when our children were little, uh, you know, they would go up and down the line changing laps. They are sitting with mom or sitting next to dad, and then they want to sit on their big sister's, their, their big brother's lap or, or grandma's lap or whatever. And, and that's great. It's okay. Now, if you have a discipline situation, something that needs to be dealt with, okay, you can leave the service. Deal with it. Come back when you're ready. It's all good. Now, there's another side of this, and that is, well, what can church leaders do to help kids engage in the corporate worship service? If the, the job of the church leader is to help all the generations worship, if the job of the pastor is to preach all God's word to all God's people, that if he's got to teach the five-year-olds and the 85-year-olds at the same time, the way they did it in the New Testament, then there's going to be some specific practical things that church leaders can do to build this kind of multi-generational community. And I want to point you, if this is you, if you're like, man, how could we do this in our church? Let me encourage you to get a copy of my new book, Visionary Church, How Your Church Can Strengthen Families. Visionary Church, How Your Church Can Strengthen Families. It lays out a a theological base for family ministry and, and then is a really a comprehensive guide for how your church, through the corporate worship service, men's and women's and youth and children's and single ministries and all the different aspects of your church, can help equip families and bring the generations together to make a difference in the world for Christ. So Visionary Church, How Your Church Can Strengthen Families, you can get it wherever you get your books. Of course, it's available on our website at visionaryfam.com, visionaryfam.com. Now, let me wrap up with this. It's not just about helping kids get the most out of church, but the ministry that your children have in your church. It's not just about how do I help my kids get the inputs from the corporate worship gathering, but they actually have a calling. They actually have a ministry to the church that God calls them to engage in, and you don't want your church to miss out on it. Let me share with you a couple of scriptures that, that illustrate this. You may remember the uh, the historical example, we find this in the Gospel of Mark with, when Jesus, with Jesus and the little children. This is Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. I'll summarize it. People are bringing children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuke the parents. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. So he's righteously angry with his disciples. And he says, let the little children come to me. And he took the children in his arms. He put his hands on them and blessed them. Now, this word indignant is an unusual word in the New Testament. The next time we find it is Matthew 21, uh, after Jesus' triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. So if you remember, after his triumphal entry, uh, he's riding on the donkey, Hosanna to the son of David. The next day, Jesus comes back into Jerusalem to begin his uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People tour. Uh, No, not so much. He comes back into Jerusalem, and the first thing he does is he goes to the temple. He tears through the temple. He drives out the, the, the money changers. And, and the people who are doing corrupt things. And, and he says, my house shall be a house of, of prayer. Now, the Pharisees are not mentioned at that portion of the text. We could assume that the Pharisees were not happy with what Jesus is doing, but they're not mentioned. The next thing that happens is the blind and the lame came into this special area of the temple and Jesus healed them. Now, the reason why this was important is that this particular area of the temple, uh, the Old Testament law said that a a, a blind person, a crippled person, could not go there. You You couldn't have any physical deformities to come into this holy place. Now, today we might say that that's just a a horrible, judgmental, discrimination thing, but it was actually a gospel lesson 
It was a gospel message. Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Only he with clean hands and a pure heart. In other words, who can come into the presence of God? Only the perfect person. Only the sinless person. Who can go to heaven? Only the perfect person. Only the sinless person. So where does that leave you? Where does that leave me? Out. We need a savior from heaven to save us. Okay, sermon for another day. So the blind and the lame come in. And once again, we don't hear from the Pharisees, although we could assume that they were probably pretty upset. But then children came in and the children started crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. And now the Pharisees are mentioned and it says they were indignant. Now, I want you to notice the contrast here. Jesus is indignant because the children are being kept away. The Pharisees are indignant because the children are coming in. And the Pharisees say to Jesus, say, do you hear what these little ones are saying? In other words, do you hear these children? They're in the temple. They're praising you as the son of David. Jesus replies to them. He says, yes, have you never read that out of the mouths of infants and babes, you have called forth praise? So he responds to them by quoting Psalm 8. I remember I was sharing the juxtaposition of these two passages. Okay, Mark 10, Jesus is indignant the kids are being kept away. Matthew 21, the Pharisees are indignant that the kids are coming in and sharing that contrast. I was in Malaysia and a pastor said to me, Rob, have you ever gone back into the Old Testament to find out why God calls forth praise from children? I said, I have not. He said, you should. I said, I will. Let me ask you that question. Why does God call forth praise from children? Our first instinct might be to say, well, uh, they have a childlike faith and, and God loves that childlike faith. Okay, that certainly would be fair, but that's not what it says in Psalm 8. Let me read it to you. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory in the heavens through the praise of children and infants You've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Let me read that to you again, Psalm 8, 2. You've called forth praise of children and infants. Through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. There's something that happens in the spiritual world that I cannot fully explain to you, that when children worship Jesus through singing, it shuts the mouth, it silences the devil and the demons. Now, I don't know about you, but I would like to silence the lies and temptations of the devil and his demons in my home and in my church, and I'm sure you would like to too. So what would be one of our strategies to do that? Let's get the kids singing. Let's have them engage in this mysterious way that God has called forth to have them engage in this spiritual battle that we are in. Well, I hope that some of these suggestions have helped you practically. I hope the scripture that I just shared with you has inspired you to bring your whole family together, just like all the followers of God in the Old Testament and New Testament did, that when it comes to the corporate worship gathering of our church, that this is something for us to do with our kids and grandkids beside us. As always, I'd love to hear from you. You've got comments, you've got questions, you've got thoughts about today's podcast. Just send me an email, podcast at visionaryfam.com. And don't forget to pick up that book, Visionary Church, How Your Church Can Strengthen Families. It is filled with powerful scriptures and a comprehensive practical plan with how your church can equip families to pass faith through the generations. And I look forward to our next conversation on Family Vision 